Well, good evening, and welcome to another presentation of the Hallelujah Diet uh, webinars. We do these monthly, and it's a privilege to be able to bring them to you. Um, I'm Paul Malcolmus, uh, president of Hallelujah Diet. And tonight we have a great speaker with us tonight. It's uh, Dr. Michael Donaldson. He's our uh, research director, and so we'll be real excited to introduce him as he talks more about fish oil and some of the research that's out there relating to uh, the benefits of, of fish oil. Before we get started, though, when I introduce um, Dr. Donaldson, I'd like to just go ahead and highlight the um, app that you're using. And if you have any questions during the presentation, down in the bottom left-hand corner, feel free to just send us a question. We'll do question and answers at the end, but uh, we are monitoring throughout the presentation, so if you have any problems with audio or any technical issues, feel free to drop us a note, and we'll, um, we'll see if we can help you uh, maintain a pre good presentation. Before we get started, I'd like to um, lead us in a word of prayer and ask the Lord to bless our time together. Dear Lord, we just thank you for this evening, and we thank you for this opportunity to be able to present on this important topic of fish oil and the benefits that it brings people or We pray that you'll um, give Dr. Donaldson the words and the wisdom to share, Lord, and that um, all the technology will work smoothly and that through it that people will be um, helped with their health. pray that we honor you through it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Dr. Donaldson has been on board with us for 20 years. Um, he started with us in 1997. He was a uh, Cornell graduate from... Um, um, as biochemical engineering, and he's done a lot of different um, clinical intervention studies based on specific symptoms and diseases, and he focuses on the results of the Howey diet. He's authored numerous research studies, and he has played and continues to play an ongoing and important role in the new product development as well as new innovations. So, Dr. Donaldson, it's always a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Thank you, Paul, for the introduction here, and glad to be part of this. You know, I got into this really because people didn't always know what the options are. They thought, well, we we'll just do what the doctor says. But if they knew what the options are, they might make a better choice. And so tonight we're talking about fish oil. Is it a scam? Is it panacea, good for everything, or is it something else here? So I have a question for you to start with here. Would you agree that fish oil is good for you? And just before we start, I want to just check, check and see, you know, do you agree with this idea, you know, agree, disagree, and so on here. Just get an idea of, of where we are in this group here. Might be preaching to the choir tonight, it looks like, a little bit here. But you hear a lot of different things about fish oil here, too. So I think we've got... There's more people still coming on here, but this is the group that we have right now. So let's go forward. This is the kind of things we're going to talk about tonight with fish oil, cardiovascular disease, brain health, cancer, pregnancy, and inflammatory things like arthritis, and then touch a little bit on the difference of fish oil and algae oil for purity and rancidity, things like that. We'll spend most of our time up here on cardiovascular disease and, and cognitive function for brain health. And we'll touch on these ones briefly here. So let's get into this a little bit here. But if you're looking at this, give me an idea of what things that you're most interested in in knowing about fish oil here. So if you want to just pick out, pick out, you can pick out more than one if you want here. As we look out here, so inflammatory conditions ranks pretty high here. Uh, cancer a little bit, cardiovascular quite a bit, cognitive function. So those are those are topics that are are things we're going to discuss tonight. So as we look at, we'll start with cardiovascular disease here, and really there's a lot of work that has been done with fish oil. Most of the research really has been done on cardiovascular health and fish oil, and then the second largest section is probably on cognitive function. Fair about inflammatory diseases as well, but those two things are really top there. Well, here's the status of fish oil in 2018. This is from uh, the JAMA Cardiology Journal. They did a summary of 10 trials, nearly 78,000 subjects, and their conclusion was that omega-3 fatty acids had no significant association with fatal or non-fatal coronary heart disease or any major vascular events. 
In other words, fish oil is as good as a placebo. That's what they're saying there. And this was published just this, this spring here. And here's the editorial that went along with it. Just another nail in the coffin for fish oil supplements. Basically, they're done. They're no good. And you shouldn't, you know, there's nothing to see here. Please, please go on. Nothing to see. And so is that really what it is? Is it just a scam the way that, that they're declaring here? Or is there more to it here? So the pharmaceuticals on one side, they're saying that fish oil is no good. Some people that are trying to eat healthy, they're adopting a plant-based diet, and they look at fish and say, so I don't need that either. And I don't need the omega-3 oils. You know, I can get everything I need from flaxseed oil, from chia seeds and walnuts, you know, soybeans. Those all have the alpha-linolenic acid in them, and I can get all my EPA and DHA from those. So they kind of get it from both sides in fish oil. Some people don't like it because it competes with pharmaceuticals, and some say, I can do just fine without it here. Well, the question is, why don't the randomized controlled trials on fish oil and cardiovascular disease see positive results? Why is that? Well, the, there's a multiplicity of reasons here. I mean, part of it could be that there's a high baseline in some studies, like in Japan, where people eat a lot of fish. There's already high baselines. Sometimes they give a low dose of EP and DHA. Sometimes they use a ethyl ester form of the oil, and they take it with a breakfast that doesn't have much fat in it, and so it doesn't work very well in those cases. In all of these cases, you know, they're doing trials with people who have already had heart attacks. And so you think about it. Someone's got to be pretty sick to have a heart attack. So they're not exactly representative of the general population either. Some of them are too short. One of the biggest things really is the medications that are used now. Some of the earlier studies didn't have these medications available. So fish oil does a lot of the same, same things here too. You know, taking care of cholesterol levels, thinning the blood, helping with inflammation. Some of the earlier studies didn't have these drugs available. So the studies that are done, you know, they're standard care first. So if someone has a heart attack, they survive that, they get their stent or their bypass surgery, and they're put on a whole cocktail of drugs. And then they add on fish oil on top of that and see if it makes any difference. And they conclude, well, it doesn't seem to add anything to what we're already doing. But that's not really the question we're interested in. We want to know, does fish oil have an impact on cardiovascular disease? So when you're looking at this, you step back for a minute. So there's more than one way to make a bad false negative study here. For example, if you're looking for an outcome and your level that you need to get to here is, is the green line in optimal level, you start with people here for this nutrient X, and they have about this kind of outlook of output here. You give them a supplement of the nutrient X, and it goes up a little bit. And they say, well, it didn't really change because there wasn't much difference here. So they are so near to optimal function already that a little bit more didn't change it. So, for example, if someone's looking at, at calcium uptake and vitamin D, and they're not really deficient, you can methousand I use the vitamin D, and it doesn't really change the calcium uptake. So say, well, vitamin D is useless. It doesn't do anything. So go to use something else. That's one way of doing a false negative study, and there's examples of that during this presentation. The second way of doing this is taking, so you need to get up to this optimal level, and you start with people that are really deficient down here, and then you move them up to this level here in the intervention. But it's a very small dose, and it's nowhere near the optimal level. So, for example, if you're trying to prevent the common cold, and you give someone 100 milligrams of vitamin C, well, it improves their vitamin C status a little bit, but it's not near enough to get them up to this level up here. Or if you have someone that's eating just a serving of vegetables every other day, and you get them up to taking two servings of vegetables a day. And you look, at, um, you look for outcomes for cancer, heart disease, diabetes. And it says, well, you know, we've increased their vegetable intake fourfold, but it didn't make any difference. So vegetables aren't the key. Well, they're just not near enough to the outcome and the high enough level to make a difference here. So, again, you get a false negative study. So keep those two ideas in mind as we go through this. Part of what you need to do really is to look at 
the levels of a biomarker. I like biomarker studies where you're actually looking at what's actually in the body, not just what people say they took or what we gave them, but how much is actually in them. So omega-3 index is, a, is defined as the amount of EPA and DHA fats in red blood cell membranes. So you take a blood sample, spin down, just get the red blood cells and analyze those for fats. And then it'll be the amount of EPA and DHA in those. So um, Bill Harris and, and another scientist came up with this and said if it's less than 4%, that's an undesirable level. If it's greater than 8%, you're gonna have good outcomes here. And then looked at several studies and said, well, it seems to hold pretty well for this. So that's kind of, you need to keep this in mind here. We're going to look at a lot of studies here that are checking actually blood levels of fats, not just what they say they took or how much they took. And you'll, we'll get an idea of how much you really need to take along the way here. So here's a study of 19 cohorts. This was published back in 2016, so it's a fairly current study here looking at 16 different countries. It's a pr prospective study. So looking at people over time. So measuring blood levels, not just intakes. And they found that there was a lower risk of fatal coronary heart disease for all the different long chain omega-3 fats. For, so there's a one standard deviation increase in concentration, about a 9% lower risk of heart disease. And if you compare the highest versus the lowest quintile, that's the highest 20%, versus the lowest 20%, there's a 23% decrease in risk of fatal coronary heart disease. Now, that's quite a bit different than what we saw in the last slide. It gets a little better here. So from that, there's kind of a follow-up study. Some of the same authors took that data here and said, well, from 10 of these studies, we can get a whole estimate of the omega-3 index, not just individual fats, but we kind of sum them up together. So from the lowest quintile being 4.2%, highest quintile, 8.3%. So that's that spread from four to eight. And they found that your risk of fatal coronary heart disease was reduced by 30% going from four to eight percent there for the omega-3 index. So 30% difference. That's quite a bit different from what, the, what was published in JAMA Cardiology, saying there's no significant, no significant difference of use in omega-3 fat. Fish oil didn't make any difference according to them here, when you look at levels in the blood among healthy people followed over time, you find a 30% difference here. And it about, takes about a gram and a half of EPA and DHA a day to go from four to eight. So that's quite a bit different here. It's not the only study here, there's more. So in the offspring of the original Framingham Heart Study, you know, 2,500 people, they followed them for seven years, compare these levels, greater than about seven compared to less than four. Again, 34% lower risk of death from any cause, not just heart disease, but from any cause, and 39% lower risk of the incidence of coronary heart disease. In fact, the effect was actually stronger than cholesterol. Here's some of the graphs from there. Here's total um, cardiovascular disease, you know, a big change here. And you can measure, see as, as the levels go up from four to intermediate levels, up to 5.7, 6.8, and then greater than 6.8, you see some pretty big differences here. For total stroke, you have to have higher levels for it to make a significant difference here. Cardiovascular disease mortality in this study here, anything greater than 4.2% was protective here. So some of what you're seeing with some of the fish oil studies too is that there's kind of a threshold. Once it got above that threshold, it didn't really make any difference here. But overall, any mortality, there's about a 30% decrease in risk of mortality here. So about a third drop in the, the risk of mortality just by having higher levels of omega-3 fat. And there's more data here. Overall, we're gonna talk about 28 different studies. So you're trying to get the big picture here, but I'm giving you some of the details along the way. So in the Women's Health Initiative, there's a sub-study in that for memory here. So looking at cognitive function here. And we'll get to the cognitive function here in a little bit here. But along the way, they found that omega-3 index predicts total mortality as well. There's about a 30% decrease in risk of mortality from 8% to less than 4%, just the way it had been set up. 
originally in the design of the omega-3 index here. So over time, healthy women, you know, high levels of fish oil made a difference here. Okay, in Japan, this also makes a difference here. And notice that the omega-3 fats actually are quite a bit higher in Japan than in, in America because they eat a lot more fish. So over time here, they looked at the highest quartile versus the, the smallest, the lowest 25%, and they found the risk of sudden coronary disease or sudden cardiac death or fatal coronary events was substantially lower, almost 90% lower in this group with high levels of omega-3 fats. And so that's, that's pretty amazing, 90% less risk. And what's really amazing is the levels of omega-3 fats we're talking about here. So Bill Harris wrote an editorial after this, and he just compared levels in a, a typical population in America, and the low being around 4%, the high being about 8%, if you divide the group into 25% quartiles. In Japan, the second quartile is higher, as higher, higher than the highest level in the U.S. So that means three quarters of the population in Japan has higher levels than anybody in the U.S. And even then, they're seeing higher benefits at the upper levels, around 10 to 12 percent of the fats being omega-3s. So it doesn't hurt to be higher than eight; it could be 10 or 12 percent, even better in some cases. At least, at least it is in Japan. So there was a study done giving people about three grams of fish oil here, either as EPA or as DHA. And there was a crossover study, so 10 weeks on one of them, nine weeks off, and then try the other one. So they found that the EPA raised the EPA levels, not surprisingly, but it didn't raise DHA levels. So really the only way to raise DHA levels is by taking preformed DHA. The EPA doesn't even convert very well either. And DHA is the level you're looking for. So if you take DHA, you raise DHA, DHA level. So they found that DHA also works better for some inflammatory markers and also for reducing cholesterol levels as well. Uh, for some markers, it wasn't much different. For CRP, IL-6, and TNF-alpha, those inflammatory markers were about the same for EPA and DHA. But overall, the DHA worked better than EPA. So just keep that in mind. That's one reason why we offer a professional strength DHA, not professional strength EPA. So for, for heart disease, fish oil does really still make a difference here. And, you know, you have to have enough of it, but if you, the levels are sufficient in the blood, then it does still make a, a difference among healthy people here. So we want to talk about cognitive function here, too. So if you're eating a healthy diet, you're not likely to die of diabetes, you're not likely to die of a heart attack, and your risk of cancer is also decreased. But you're going you're gonna to be older, and you want to be able to think when you get there. So you want to plan ahead of time, what do I need to have good brain function all the way through my 80s, up into my 90s, and over when I'm a, a centenarian? I still want to be sharp. So what do I need for that? Does fish oil help? We mentioned the Women's Health Initiative memory study before, so about 6,500 people. In this analysis, 6,700 women. They found a two standard deviation increase in omega-3 fats. That's going from something like 4% like to 8%. They found a 16% lower risk of probable dementia by increasing levels of omega-3. And over time, you know, the group at five years, one and a half percent of them had probable dementia and increased up to almost 12% at 15 years. So if you had higher levels of omega-3 index, that was about a 2% decrease in incidence in dementia over that time period. That may not seem like a whole lot, but it, it adds up over time here. There's a few cross-sectional studies I want to emphasize before we get to the, to the intervention studies. Cross-section means you can't really find um, a cause and effect. You just find an association. You don't know really which came first. But of those here in Japan, the 80-year-olds in Japan, who had higher levels of EPA or EPA plus DHA, they had higher global cognitive function. So just an association, higher levels of EPA and DHA seem to 
and help them have better cognitive capability here. And another study here among 720 people, again, elderly people, comparing not so low levels with higher levels, they found those that had low levels of omega-3 had a 77% increased risk of cognitive impairment. Not just not, not, not full-blown dementia, but just they weren't performing well on the test that they were given. So there's a, another perspective study here. This is the original Framingham Heart Study cohort. They followed them over nine years, and they found 99 new cases of dementia here. They started with only the ones that were free of dementia at baseline. And the upper quartile of DHA was 4.2%. So if you add the omega-3 index all together with the EPA, they're probably 6%, maybe a little bit better there. But they find that the upper quartile had a 47% lower risk of dementia here, following them over time. So they measured the omega-3 index at the beginning of the study, and then just looked to see who got dementia and who didn't, and then compared that with your levels of, of the omega-3 index as well as DHA here. So the trend for lower risk of Alzheimer's disease, it wasn't as significant as total dementia there, but it was trending that direction as well. So it looks like, you know, if you measure omega-3 indexes index and you have low levels, your risk over time of dementia increases. So there's a few intervention studies we want to look at as well here. So intervention studies take people that have low levels of the omega-3 index, less than 4.8. Even in France, they give them a little bit more than a gram of DHA and EPA. The one cognitive test that they used showed a significantly less decline over time. So it looks like it was having a, a positive effect there in France. So keep in mind, that was about a gram a day here. Here in this one, in this study here, they actually were testing B vitamins. They're trying to lower homocysteine because high levels of homocysteine also have a negative effect on cognitive function. So what they found, if you had high levels of omega-3s in your brain, in your body, you were less likely to have um, be diagnosed with dementia here. And there's a couple of graphs here I'd like to show you on that. In the placebo group here, they didn't get any B12, B6, or folate. Really no difference in episodic memory. And you categorize them by omega-3 levels for lowest tertiary to highest. Here you get an effect, and it's significantly different from the effect here. Even though they have, these have high levels of omega-3s with the B vitamins, it makes a difference. Uh, global cognition here, again, you're seeing a positive effect when you have the omega-3 index higher and you give them B vitamins together. If you give them B vitamins and they don't have the fats, you actually don't get a, a positive effect here. And one more picture here. This is for the clinical dementia rating score. So if you had low levels of omega-3s, you're likely, just as likely as, as the placebo, to have a score greater than zero, greater than 60% here. But it drops down about half as high if you have high levels of omega-3s. So they work well together, the B vitamins and omega-3 fats, because they're nutrients. They're not silver bullets that just take care of everything. You need quite a few different vitamins and minerals and nutrients really as a team. You know, you can think of it as any, any team sport. You may have a star player, but by himself, he can't carry the whole team. He needs all the supporting cast to do it with him. And they really work well together, not just as a silver bullet kind of treatment here. So fish oil is not a panacea in that sense. It doesn't fix everything all by itself. It needs a strong supporting cast. So I need to talk about this alpha omega trial, even though it is bad science, because other people have brought it up and said, well, this shows that omega-3 fats don't work. So they're, they're giving a dose of 400 milligrams a day. And you know that's, that's not an unreasonable dose in some places or two grams of ALA, which is actually a pretty unreasonable dose. That's very low. I mean, for flax oil, that's not very much at all. So some of these people are already taking fish, but what happened? They didn't find any effect. What happened in this study? And we look at the pictures of blood levels, because they reported those. 
Here's the ALA levels, EPA levels here in the middle, and DHA levels here. Well, if you add the EPA levels here from baseline up to the intervention here, this is less than 2.5. This is less than 1. If I add 2.5 and, and 1, I still get only 3.5, and, and it's a little bit less than that. So they started really low, and they didn't get much higher. So that's that second type of false study that I was talking about. We have a, a negative study that was actually not true. They need to actually give a lot more of the, of the oil to make a difference among these people here. Rather than just saying it didn't make a difference, they should say that 400 milligrams was an insufficient dose. And that's what we would say here. It just wasn't a sufficient dose here. So there's a couple of studies here in China here. In the first study they did, they looked at about a gram, about 1,200 milligrams of DHA and EPA together here. Um, these people were woefully deficient in omega-3 fats. I mean, together from 2.35, when they gave them this 1,200 milligrams, they went up to 3%. So woefully deficient, really. And still they saw some positive results on, on a basic cognitive aptitude test that they had. They saw some results, but they wanted to do more. So the next trial, they did quite a bit more. They went to 2 grams of DHA and did it for 12 months, not just for half a year. More people. Uh, serum DHA levels really shot up here, almost 4% more. They went up a little bit in the placebo group as well. But in the three cognitive tests that they found, they found significant differences. They also found significant differences in the volume of the hippocampus in the brain. That's the region of the brain. And I didn't know exactly what the hippocampus did myself either, so I had to go look this up a bit. And the hippocampus is actually a little section of the brain. It kind of looks like a seahorse, actually. And it's involved in memory formation, consolidation, taking short-term memory, and really helping your brain store it long-term. And it's one of the most severely affected regions of the brain for a cognitive function here. And when it shrinks, it's kind of a hallmark uh, structural feature when someone's going from just um, a mild cognitive impairment all the way down to Alzheimer's disease. When that volume of that hippocampus shrinks, you're well on your way to actually full-blown dementia here. So when they gave people two grams of DHA a day, they found that this, this saved that volume, it wasn't decreasing like it was in the other groups there, in the placebo group. So again, the Framingham offspring cohort, they did another cohort uh, cross-sectional measure and looking at 4.4% versus 6.5%, they found the lower group, the lower 25% had lower scores on visual memory, executive function, and abstract thinking here. When they did MRI scans, they also found that the brain volume was lower and they had greater white matter in hyperintensity. The hyperintensity is an indicator of greater risk of stroke and dementia. I think it's an indication of lower blood flow, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken there. So those areas, you don't want to see this, this white matter hyperintensity where the signal is really strong on your MRI scan. So they're protective. They says, well, Anything above 4.4% was protective here in that case. Now, we might beg to differ on some of the other results that we've seen as well. You know, that you may want to have higher levels than that as well here. <clears throat> and even in this study here, the well, Women's Health Initiative Memory Study, this is a section here where they did MRIs as well. So they followed women for eight years. They found that if you had a two standard deviation increase in the omega-3 index, that's about 3.2% higher, that you'd have about a four, about half a percent larger brain volume. And that correlates with about two years of normal brain aging. And they also found that the hippocampal volume also was, was maintained. It didn't necessarily increase, but it didn't decrease the way it did in the placebo group. So if you had a 4% difference in omega-3 index, that was about two-thirds of a percent larger brain volume. So your brain's not shrinking as fast if you have the omega-3 fats in there. Now, another study here. This is the last one I want to talk about for cognitive function here. This is not just looking at cross-sectional studies or levels of omega-3s. This is giving people the omega-3 fats 
and measuring um, what happens in the brain here. So this is two grams a day of the, of the long chain omega-3 fatty acids, only for half a year here, so not a long study, but correlated well with the increase in omega-3 index and uh, the um, brain-derived neurotropic factor. That's like growth factor for nerve cells in your brain. So the levels here, I just want to point out this really quickly here. The levels of um, EPA changed quite a bit. Levels of DHA didn't actually change very much. And they decreased here in the sunflower seed oil group. But the difference was pretty significant here. If we look at the omega-3 index overall, notice here that they already started at 8%, which is actually on the higher side. Remember, we talked about 8% being the threshold for really good results. Anything above 8% 8, 8 was great. But here, even when they went from 8 to 10%, they found significant improvement. Okay, they were able to maintain the brain volume here. Let me look at that in the next slide here. We see a change in total brain volume. This is not significantly different from zero here, but here we almost have a half a percent difference in brain volume in just a half a year here. So that's about equivalent to two years of brain aging right here in, one, in half a year all by itself. <clears throat> Another couple graphs from here. If you look at executive function, it increased over time in the, in the people taking the, the fish oil, and it correlated well with the change in EPA as well. You know, as EPA levels increased, people tended to change in, um, better scores in the verbal fluency. And executive function also correlated with other things. As the uh, brain-derived neurotropic factor increased, they found increase in executive function as well. And here, as insulin levels went up over time, as people get more obese and they get, they get closer to diabetic, that fasting insulin level is going to creep up on them. And that actually decreases your executive function. So being diabetic or having high blood sugar is actually bad for your brain as well. You probably knew that, but this also confirms it in a, actually a cognitive function study as well. So fish oil is good for, good for your brain. If you take enough of it, it makes a significant difference in brain volume and retaining your brain as well. And that makes a difference on how well you're able to think for a long time. So we want to touch on these other topics briefly here. Um, taking omega-3 fats for reducing cancer. Here, this is looking at the nurse's health study and the health professional follow-up study. There's, you know, do you see the number of people here? They compared intakes for people taking hardly anything to more than 0.3 grams a day. 41% reduced risk of colorectal cancer-related death. People that took some fish oil or ate some fish after diagnosis had a 70% reduced risk of colorectal cancer death. And these, along the way, you notice down here, the references are all given here. You can take that PMID number and you can plug that into the um, PubMed website and you can find the full abstracts and quite often the full papers as well. So in another study where they looked at biospecimens, looking at omega-3 fats actually in whether it's blood samples or other biopsies and things, and they found that there's reduced risk of cancer also for those who had higher levels of the omega-3 fat. So being protective here, in the physician's health study, and over a 13-year follow-up, they looked at cases who had uh, low levels, tended to have low levels of omega-3 fats. Controls didn't have as high risk, they found if you had if you had higher levels of the fats, you had a 40% lower risk of prostate cancer. And this is comparing 2.7% versus 5.7. So pretty low levels overall, but really low levels in the bottom uh, quintile here. And also, one more uh, group looking at liver cancer. This has been studied quite a bit, so the, there's a meta-analysis of 11 studies. Group them all together here. This is just intakes here, not looking at blood levels, but they found that fish oil was able to consume, reduce risk as well. So if you had higher levels of the omega-3 fats taking them, you're less likely to have cancer as well. Pretty significant reduced risk of cancer by having omega-3 fats. Not, not as many of you were interested in pregnancy, 
But every one of you went through the womb, and you got one shot at doing it. So every kid deserves a good chance, too. You get one shot, shot at this, really. So I just have one slide on this, but there's a systematic review, meta-analysis of nine different trials where they give women who are pregnant DHA, and they follow them over time through the pregnancy. And the biggest takeaway right here is the risk of early preterm birth, less than 34 weeks. A lot of intense care goes into those um, preemies at that point, but you get a decrease of 58% when you group all these nine studies together here. If any preterm birth was reduced 17%, but this early preterm birth was reduced really amazingly. You know, you could you could cut the rates in half just by taking DHA. So while you're pregnant, you should take DHA if you want full-term babies, fewer allergies, higher intelligence, and if you as a mom don't want postpartum depression. It helps with all of those things. Uh, there's been some studies showing that if you take about two grams a day of the long chain omega-3 fats, that your children are less likely to have wheeze and asthma growing up as well. So fish oil is good for pregnancy. Fish oil is also good for inflammatory conditions, things like rheumatoid arthritis. And there's been studies along the years showing that this really does help. But here's one more study, a recent study here, you know, a double-blind randomized control study here, taking two grams of DHA from algae oil. They had to take eight grams of oil to get there, but they did. And so they both, they did 10 weeks with a washout period in between and then crossed over to the placebo, to the, to the fish oil, or to the algae oil, and vice versa here. So the omega-3 index really increased, going from four and a half to over eight, and tender and swollen joints decreased. If you look at this graph here, it's this first one here. It's for a number of tender joints and number of swollen joints. Instead of increasing, you're getting a decrease in that 10-week period. And you combine them together here, you get a very nice result here. So that means it's going to feel better if you take fish oil, if you have inflammatory conditions here. So the dose matters. You have to take enough to make a difference. This was 2 grams of DHA a day for that. So we want to wrap this up and talk about purity and potency of the fish oil as well. So when we were looking at levels of, of omega-3 fats and we were trying to find a supplement that would help us with this, we first looked at algae oils. And we did some testing of algae oils here. We looked at free fatty acids and TBA. The free fatty acids, those are um, some of the fats that have broken off of the triglyceride backbone and they're more susceptible to oxidation. So it's a, it's a measure of damage, really. Um, this is brand being measured twice here. We couldn't believe the first results. We did it again, and it was still really high. They weren't all really high, but you know these two brands were really high here for, for free fatty acids. And cod liver oil and flaxseed oil are, are much lower here. Then we looked at oxidation as well for rancidity here. And people, often people claim that it's actually you know fish oil is the rancid one. But we did testing on algae oil, and we found, you know, they were all had higher levels of the thiobarbituric acid than cod liver oil or flaxseed oil or the fish oils that we tested. You know, levels are much lower here. We didn't find an algae oil that really satisfied us. And this was several years back. Maybe that's improved a little bit. At the same time, the processing of fish oil has also improved. So I think there's still a difference there. So if you want pure fish oil, there's a couple things that the companies do to, to get good fish oil. First, they start with small fish. They don't have time, they don't have a long life cycle. They don't have time to accumulate toxicity. They get water, they, they harvest the fish from clean waters. Down around Peru and Chile, that's where they harvest the, the oil for the professional strength DHA. And they start with clean water, so you don't have much to clean up. The mercury and heavy metals actually stay in the flesh. They're not in the oil of the fish either. So the two oils that we offer for sale, they meet or exceed, generally exceed the, the international standards for fish oil and for oxidation, PCBs, dioxins, heavy metals, and label claims. We actually had a hard time with label claims with algae oils. They didn't all have as much DHA in them as they said they had. So, yeah, um, fish oil was a good way to get your EPA and DHA. If we want to summarize this, fish oil still has benefits for cardiovascular disease, and it competes directly with pharma drugs. 
for healthy people, you know, the fish oil is a much better idea than taking pharmaceutical cocktails. Um, fish oil also helps maintain brain health. You know, it helps maintain brain volume, especially of the hippocampus area as well. It helps the body when you're facing cancer. It helps with inflammatory conditions. You know, you need to get the right amount. The best results, when I reviewed the literature here doing this, the best results were seen when people took about 2 grams of the omega-3 fats a day. So that's about a teaspoon of the Pharmax fish oil. That would be two capsules of the professional strength DHA. So if you're facing a current health challenge, that's a good level to use. If you're just maintaining, you might be able to get away with maybe half that much. So that's, that's quite a bit more than they recommend for cardiovascular disease at this point. The professional associations don't recommend that much. But the studies are pointing to that much to really make a difference here. You can use the omega-3 index to guide how much you want to take of the fish oil. And that's easy. Omega Quant is the, is the company that offers those. Uh, they send you a packet. You squeeze your blood onto a paper. You send it back to them and give you the results in a few days. So you can... You know, check that to make sure you're taking enough fish oil and that what you're taking is getting you to the level that you want. So it's a good idea, idea to do that at least once. So fish oil is a pure, economical, and sustainable way to get your long-chain omega-3 fats. Now I have one more question for you. Those are here now. Would you agree that now that fish oil is good for you? So if you just want to add in your response now, would you agree or disagree here? So I'll give you just a couple more minutes here. After hearing this presentation, what do you think here? So I'm just going to skip to the results here and go from here. So most of you, you know, you got the idea that fish oil really is good for you. You take enough of it, and it actually makes a major impact on possible um, future health conditions, as well as conditions that you might be um, suffering with right now. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for listening. We have time for a couple questions here. If you have questions, Paul, if you want to look at those, and if you have a question, you can fill them in on the chat box here as well. Yeah. Well, that, that sounds really great, Dr. Donaldson. A lot of good information there and, and definitely um, shows that the research um, validates that there's good use with um, having fish oil as part of our daily regimen. So thank you so much for sharing that information. Um, you presented such great in, um, detail. I don't have any questions at this point. So um, if there's any questions before we wrap up, um, feel free to submit them there. Um, but it's, it was definitely a, a well put together presentation. So, um, so you, is there a, a preference over the oil itself or the, the capsules, Dr. Donaldson? Um, I don't have a preference. Some people may uh, have an easier time taking the oil, remember taking the, or the capsules. It's really a per, uh, personal preference, really. The DHA is more concentrated in the capsules, though. So if you want just the DHA, and that's really what most of you need, I mean, that, that works as a good option for people. And okay. the oil is actually more stable in a, in a gel cap like that as well. So you could leave it out where you can see it and remember to take it. Whereas the oils, you really need to keep in the refrigerator, and it's harder to remember to take it. So there's, there is advantage of the capsules for that. I always have a hard time remembering the, the liquids in the refrigerator. Um, your, your thoughts on for children, what age group, and if they're um, hyperactive, would it help, and, and how much would they um, would you recommend for a child? We have a, a recipe for a, a brain smoothie that, that we have, and it includes some fish oil with it, as well as some nutritional essentials, and you know, in the context of a regular smoothie, and that's helped people help kids calm down quite a bit with that. And it's you know, I would start with like a gram a day of EPA and DHA for a child that you know has a has a health challenge right now. They might not need that much for ongoing needs. But if you want to see an effect, don't be afraid to give them enough to make a difference. Um, 
And does it make a difference what time of day you have the, the fish oil or the capsules? Does it need to be with food or, or away from food? It's best with food, preferably a meal that has some other fat in it in as well. That's just going to increase the absorption that you're getting there. If you take it all by itself, you'll get some absorption, but not near as well as if you take it with other fatty foods. And that would be the same with if uh, somebody put the oil in juice, uh, there would be more benefit from it. Is that correct? Right. If you put it in with juice or something, that's fine. But along the way, you probably want some oils there as well, some other oils. Okay. Um, how do you recommend, um, reconcile Campbell, Dr. Campbell's and Dr. Eppenstein's position on no oil? They found some good results when they restrict fats overall, like, like less than 10% of the diet. And our experience hasn't been that you need to do that as much. Some fats are actually beneficial for you, and actually there's some, condition, some, some protection in the body from having some fats. And your brain needs some of those fats, too. So you really do need some of these, especially the long-chain omega-3 fats. There's no other way to get DHA than actually to take it. Your body makes only very trace amounts from flaxseed oil or chia seeds, things like that. You really do need some of the omega-3 fats. And I mm -hmm. think they make a little bit of allowance for that now. But I think, I think there's room for a little bit more... Um, not quite so strict on, on the fat part, you know, avocados and sources of fat that come from whole foods. Those are beneficial whole foods, and you shouldn't just throw those out of the diet. And you'll still get good results with that. I'm not that, sure if that reconciles that, it completely, but that's, that might be a long story. <laughs> no, that makes sense. Um So Even somebody, if you want to follow what they're saying and taking no oil, that doesn't include the omega-3 fats. You have to make an exception for that. There's no way around that. Right. Um, in, in any studies that um, compare flaxseed with fish oil? Now, we've done a study with that, too, and that's, it hasn't been fully published, so I won't talk about it a lot. But the general results... And it agrees with the rest of the studies here. Back in 2009, there was a, a statement put out and said the only way to get DHA in the body really is to take preformed DHA. And that's what our study found as well, even among vegans that are not consuming very much omega-6 fats either. And even among women vegans not consuming a much omega-3 fats, or a much omega-6 fats, there wasn't much competition in them. And it still didn't you still couldn't make DHA from the flaxseed oil. It just, it just doesn't really work very well. You make very trace amounts, but it's not anywhere near optimal level. It just doesn't convert enough to the, to the DHA. No, it won't convert. Not, not reliably. Okay. Um, the, the person who asked about the oil and juice um, ask for clarification. So oil in my juice is not a good way to take the oil is, is the question. It, it's okay to take it that way. It would be better to take it with food that has some fat in it as well. And if you're, if you're following the juice up with some other food after it, half an hour later that has fat in it, that would be fine. Okay. But if you're, if you're just like on a, on a juicing diet and you're not and that's all you have in the morning, and you take the oil in the morning and you don't have anything for three hours later that has fat in it, you should just take it later okay. with other food. Um, somebody asked if, if we're saying that DHA is better than flax, hemp, and chia seeds. For the omega-3 fats, yes. Flax seeds are great. I put flax seeds in my smoothies every day too, but I don't do it just for the ALA. Uh, there's all the other benefits in whole foods, in whole uh, foods that have fat in them. Same with chia seeds and hemp seeds. A lot of good minerals and good protein in there as well. But that's not a reliable source of long-chain omega-3 fats. So you need the DHA for the omega-3 fats. You need the seeds for all the benefits that come in seeds. Makes sense. 
Um, and uh, I guess uh, we can make this our last question. Um, what are some other optimal fats besides avocados? Um, a little bit of olive oil, extra virgin olive oil works good. A little bit of coconut oil or, you know, whole coconut, not just coconut oil, but even whole coconut, that works as a whole food. You know, extra virgin olive oil is a winner. It's been around a long time. Uh, Udo's oil, that's a good oil. Uh, flaxseed oil, those are good. Not Those are good for eating, not so much for cooking. Um, yeah, the, the, the oils that are high on omega-6 fats may not be such a good choice, especially if they've been refined. Unrefined ones aren't so bad. As long as you're getting omega-3 fats, the amount of omega-6 fats don't actually make that much of a difference. It's not the ratio of them that's really critical. It's that you're getting the omega-3 fats in there. So that, that gives you some guidelines. And in our website, we talk more about, you know, which are the best fats to be using for your foods as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, I think we should probably go ahead and wrap it up for the night. We, we certainly appreciate uh, the presentation and, and you taking the time to answer all the questions. We had some great questions. So thank you, everyone, for your participation with it. All right. You're very welcome. Thank you all for listening. I hope this all is right, helpful and great. beneficial to you. Yes, it, it certainly was. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Donaldson. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. And we look forward to next month's presentation. We hope you'll be back with us. And until then, God bless and uh, stay healthy and safe. Good night. Thank you. Please stand by.